Today on Call Out, Whistler's search and rescue teams comb the backcountry for a lost snowshoer. We saw some tracks up on the top of the ridge up behind us here. We seem to be picking up a transceiver. And later, should fees be charged for search and rescue? There is a very real concern that if fees were to be applied, then people reporting a missing person might think twice about it. Monday, 6.45 p.m. Whistler Search and Rescue was notified that a young backcountry hiker is missing. Mark Thibault, an avid snowboarder originally from Quebec, had set off alone for his first overnight snow camping trip. When Mark did not show up for work two days later, he was reported missing. The subject was described as not being very experienced and, and uh, certainly not knowledgeable of the area. Um, he had this burning desire to complete um, a level of mountaineering. On top of the increasing avalanche danger, poor route finding weather, we presumed that this person would definitely be in need of help. Friends reported that Mark planned to start his journey from the top of Whistler Mountain, intending to travel part of the Spearhead Traverse, a popular but very challenging backcountry ski route atop the range that links Whistler and Blackcomb Mountains. The Spearhead Traverse is spectacular. A two-day trek in good weather, it is considered a rite of passage for ski tourers in the area. It's not for the inexperienced. He had been out for two days already, and by the description of the equipment that he had with him, we knew that he could quite possibly be in very serious danger. He's got uh, snowshoes, food, a sleeping bag. We weren't sure if he had a tarp or not. Definitely doesn't have a tent. With less than an hour of daylight left, the team launches a hasty search. The helicopter heads directly for Whistler Mountain, then follows the spearhead traverse southeast, in the fading daylight, the team spots snowshoe tracks. Those tracks led down into a very hazardous area, open creeks, uh, rotten snow, avalanches, the whole host of, uh, of dangers. A ground search team on skis follows the tracks out to a hiker's staging area, concluding that the tracks were not made by the missing subject. Nightfall sets in. The search stops for the evening. It is now Tuesday morning. Two helicopter search teams prepare to leave. One helicopter team heads to Russet Hut, an overnight shelter on the Spearhead Traverse, where Mark may have gone. No entries. Mark is not in the cabin, nor has he signed the guest book. Not upstairs. While there are no signs of Mark at the cabin, there are recent snowshoe tracks heading out from Russet Hut directly into an avalanche area. A snowshoe is spotted on the ground. We saw some tracks up on the top of the ridge up behind us here. And there is some avalanche debris below it. We seem to be picking up a transceiver out of the helicopter. Uh, so we're just sending some members on foot to uh, go and investigate. It's quite a nasty ridge, lots of cornice on the top of it, so we've got a couple of guards out. Cornice is an overhanging mass of snow and ice formed by drifting wind and snow. The sheer weight and volume of falling cornice often triggers an avalanche on the slope below. The safety of search teams is paramount. Team leader Daryl Kincaid a full-time professional heli-ski guide and certified level two avalanche technician, performs an avalanche risk assessment. He determines that the area is stable and safe to do the transceiver sweep. They traverse the area, trying to pick up a signal on their mobile avalanche transceivers. 20 minutes later, nothing. The transceiver signal was likely radio interference. The snowshoe? The SAR base reports that it doesn't match the style or color used by Mark. With both helicopters low on fuel, the teams return to base to regroup. We burned up about eight hours of helicopter flying and came up empty-handed with no results whatsoever. 
reports of lots of skier traffic, but above 6,000 feet, uh, tracks had pretty much been eradicated by the fresh snow and the wind action. So very little clue as to where this uh, person had, had gone, such that we had to bring the teams back in, re-interview all of the witnesses and all of the information that we had, and then sit down and apply what's called the uh, Matson Consensus. The team of search experts divide the spearhead traverse into segments. Everybody assigns a probability of detection percentage to each segment based on their knowledge of the area and what they believe the subject might do. With all the high probability areas already covered, search leader Braden Douglas has a hunch that marks straight east towards Naden Glacier, a rarely traveled area. The hunch pays off. We had one snowboard turn mark that had gone downhill, and uh, we, then we, we then had his direction of travel. They follow Mark's tracks down along the Chequemus River for the next three hours. On the south side of Chequemus Lake, the tracks lead into the forest, where visibility from the air is almost zero. Low on fuel again, they turn back, calling their coordinates into the nearby RCMP helicopter that will bring a dog team in to search the area. At the heliport, they're comparing search notes when the news comes in. Four o'clock, we got to the heliport and we sound like we yeah, found Buddy already. The RCMP helicopter with the dog team spotted Mark on the edge of Chequemus Lake. He was right on the edge of a, a thawing lake. So you got big, huge first growth trees and then a little bit of shore. So we had to do a hover entry. So the helicopter's not gonna land. It's just gonna come in really close and we're gonna slowly crawl up into the helicopter. The team rejoices with Mark. Everyone is relieved about the happy outcome. It's not always that way. I was... Yeah, yeah, I thought I was in fits and... Yeah, exactly. The subject was um, extremely lucky to be alive and uh, was um, clearly very disoriented in where he thought he was. And had he maintained his direction and uh, travel regime that he was on when we found him, he probably would never have been found. The real question is, what was Mark thinking when he set out alone into the mountains, inexperienced, poorly equipped, and without a plan? Now, his story. I thought I would give it a try to do uh, the whole like spirit traverse. I thought I could do that in two days and uh, yeah that day I just like got caught in like the heat of the moment kind of like it was too nice and I, I didn't stick to the plan. With no map or compass and little knowledge of the area, Mark just follows the tracks of others who are also doing the traverse. I didn't know exactly where I was going so I was really like relying on those tracks. When I uh, went to bed at night, it was nice and like uh, shining stars in the sky and everything was fine. So I thought that everything would be beautiful when I wake up again. I woke up with like six inches of snow on me. All my stuff were like covered in snow and my boots as well. I could still see tracks a little bit. When I like traversed to the next peak, then I couldn't see any tracks anymore. In his haste, Mark walks right off the edge of a steep bank dropping several meters. And at the end of that day, yeah, I was guessing I'm not in the right direction because I would have recognized some spots by then. And I, I was still not 100% sure, but I, I was starting to be like, OK, I don't know where I am. He's no longer using his snowboard, but he keeps it for protection. It's kind of very wild over there. And it's springtime as well, so I was kind of scared to see bears or something like that. And like I thought like the board would be pretty much the only way I could try to defend myself if I have to. By Monday night, Mark has traveled nearly 30 kilometers in very challenging conditions. I now knew I was lost and uh, like I was kind of planning to stay in the woods for quite a while because I didn't see the end of like where I was going to walk to and that night, I just stopped hiking a bit earlier and I set myself a really nice camp and kept a nice warm fire for quite a while. I made myself some tea and like 
kind of recovering from like all the hiking I did in the days before. I had less and less energy at that time because I was eating less food. So I was hoping that like the day I should work and I'm not to work, someone's gonna realize I'm like not there and someone's gonna start to <laughs> look for me. I didn't panic. I was just thinking I gotta do what I gotta do and just uh, keep on and try to keep on going. Mark arrives at Chequemus Lake on Tuesday morning. That lake seemed to be out of like nowhere. Like it was too long. I couldn't even see the end of that lake and, and I didn't want to fall into a frozen lake neither. And I was starting to hear helicopters swimming around, so uh, it really made me think like, okay, like I should be just staying at a safe place right now and like, you know, picked a big branch and like I was waving the branch. Finally the guys saw me. Like, the struggle was over, and you know, it, it was a pretty good feeling. I'm feeling very sorry for everyone that I made work so hard, and I was very happy that like, everything ended like, safely and everything, because I wasn't ready at all, and I know it. I'm not exactly sure what would have happened if uh, those guys wouldn't have been there. Felt like you had a good fire today. As in all cases, um, you know, Whistler Search and Rescue continues to broadcast the need for the general public to, to tell people where they're going to file a proper plan to have the appropriate equipment and the knowledge for their intended route and to watch weather and avalanche conditions and, and go out prepared and have a great day. Up next, search and rescue may be free, but it isn't cheap. We want to be able to get out there early and be successful in whatever it is we need to do. When someone goes missing in Canada's vast wilderness, teams of searchers spring into action. While they might be military, Coast Guard, or other paid professionals, Many times, they're volunteer ground search and rescue teams, unpaid professionals who give their time and risk their lives to save others. We've been called out for a marine rescue. Whether they're searching for a seasoned, well-equipped outdoorsman who got a bad break, or a poorly equipped novice, the rescues won't cost either subject a dime. Unless the subject is engaged in illegal activities, intoxicated, using drugs, or if it's SAR support for an industrial incident. Free rescue, in particular for people who've deliberately taken risks, is a contentious issue. But search and rescue want their services to remain free. There is a very real concern that if fees were to be applied, then people reporting a missing person might think twice about it. And certainly from a volunteer's point of view, we want to be able to get out there early and be successful in whatever it is we need to do. The rescues may be free, but they're most certainly not cheap. Many callouts occur late in the day, so a helicopter is the quickest way to find people before darkness falls. A mobile command vehicle includes a host of features, such as sophisticated radio and mapping technology to coordinate a major operation. Specially equipped rescue trucks transport crew and equipment for a variety of rescue operations. Backcountry ski teams require top-notch gear, usually bought on their own dime. A new marine rescue craft with the latest SAR gear can cost about $160,000. And mountain rope rescue climbing equipment simply must not fail, so it's replaced often. It all adds up, and the money has to come from somewhere. The federal and provincial governments pay for all direct costs of a rescue, for specialized training, and even the purchase of some big ticket ground SAR equipment. But the funds are spread pretty thin. The difference is made up by the ground search and rescue members themselves through fundraising. Saturday, 10 a.m. Whistler Search and Rescue are unloading for a major operation. The mission? raised $45,000 for local search and rescue. Uh, this is the benefit dinner. It's our biggest fundraiser of the year. The crew is getting ready for Wind Up, an annual fundraising dinner for Whistler Search and Rescue. 
Like other volunteer search and rescue teams, Whistler members contribute thousands of hours every year to saving lives. To do their jobs effectively, they need facilities, training, and equipment. Some 10 years ago, it was recognized by uh, independent uh, members of the community that the search and rescue group could really use a hand in fundraising. We were kind of uh, strapped every year for, for cash, and they took it upon themselves to come up with this concept of a really unique fine dining paired with wine and silent auctions to raise funds. Sue Stafford and Jennifer Villard are the SAR managers for this important mission. They've been carefully planning and doing the groundwork for many months. The entire event is donated by members of the community. So we have Whistler Mountain that donates this fantastic venue for it. All the chefs donate their time and suppliers, wineries, which also contribute to it. So it's a very good fundraiser for us. Even SAR members open their wallets. As volunteers, when they're out doing a search, they get a, a daily allowance, um, a per diem from the provincial government. But most of the volunteers, I think all of the volunteers, donate that back into search and rescue. So actually, it's costing them money. The community gives generously because they know the true value of the dedicated service that search and rescue provides to them. The money that we raise here tends to go into capital projects, equipment replacement, um, some training, but primarily renewing rescue equipment. Over at the base of Mount Washington on Vancouver Island, Comox Valley Search and Rescue have their own fundraiser underway. The volunteer commitment of this group alone um, is about 15 to 16,000 hours per year. We probably fundraise as much as we train. They'll earn 15% commission on everything, raising tens of thousands of dollars for Comox Valley Search and Rescue operations. So who's gonna be in the auction room? Okay. okay. Whistler SAR has been staging the fundraiser for three hours now. Tonight, they're showing off equipment purchased thanks to donations from the community. Swift water rescue equipment, a boogie board, dry suits, helmets, and then uh, the HETS equipment that uh, needs to be replaced every eight years and that $20,000 a show, uh, it takes more than one year to uh, fundraise for it. This has all got its weight mark on it for your helicopter. Search and rescue teams use some pricey equipment and push it to its limits. Tonight we have earmarked a new rescue toboggan that we can pull behind uh, a snow machine. Ours is about 17 years old now and is uh, has a number of stress fractures and is not really usable at this point in time. The last minute touches are still underway as the guests begin to arrive. Whistler Search and Rescue is on duty, though for most, it's a different duty than they're used to. Uh, hanging underneath the helicopter, now I'm hanging jackets. <laughs> Spirits are high. The guests are coming through in a big way. I'm here to support Search and Rescue in Whistler. They are a bunch of the most amazing guys you'll ever come across. And that's why this dinner is a sellout every single year, and so it should be. The event is on its way to being another huge success. It's really indicative of the community's desire to have in place this kind of response. You really feel like the people that attend this year after year actually feel that they're part of the team, and they are, in fact. They are an integral part of the team. Everybody's digging deep tonight. This is not a cheap dinner, but there's people here from all walks of life. There's the high rollers and there's the locals, and, and we're here because, uh, because search and rescue is such a great service to all of us. After the ticket sales, the auctions, and the donations are tabulated, Whistler SAR surpassed their goal of $45,000. The community has come through for search and rescue, so that search and rescue will continue to come through for them. I think it's really important that you reach into your community, that you communicate your need as a search and rescue team to have the community come on board and assist you in, in providing this, because I'm sure every team in all of Canada uh, needs financial support, and the best place to source that is right within your community. Call out search and rescue features, real stories, filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. 
Find out more at calloutsar.tv.